Hello, everybody. Um, everybody here and everybody there. Um, thank you for joining us on this very sunny day in a basement. Um, welcome to the book launch of writing architectural history, evidence and narrative in the 21st century uh, with the Aggr Aggregate Architectural History Collaborative and Matthew Jones. Uh, my name is Lucia Alais. I am an associate professor at Columbia and the director of the Buell Center uh, for the study of American architecture here at Columbia. Uh, today we meet on a campus on an island that lies within the ancestral homelands of the Leni Lenape people. Until about 1650, the Leni Lenape managed the forests, marshes, animals, winds, floods, and paths of this island by stopping in as they navigated what is now called the Hudson River, seasonally staying in small encampments, growing food, perhaps also harvesting crops, hunting and fishing some animal species while conserving others, periodically setting fires to control growth, and generally maintaining a, a resource ecology that stretched all along the Atlantic coast um, from what is now Western Connecticut to Delaware, including most of New Jersey and Southern New York. By the end of the 17th century, the Lenny Lenape had largely been driven out of their homelands. In the centuries since, their communities have been decimated, their humanity denied, and their descendants dispersed. Their European settler state that was responsible for this erasure and diaspora relied overwhelmingly on the institutionalization of land. And Columbia University, a land-based institution, is a legacy of this urge to settle and appropriate. One of the ways that architecture continues to be implicated in this history of displacement is through narratives. For example, the narrative that the total transformation of this island into an parcelated marvel of concrete and steel was an act of collective architectural genius unconnected to this continuous indigenous struggles. And yet new narratives are being told and written by indigenous scholars and activists who remind us that land is not an object to be parcelated, but a relationship. They tell us, for example, that much of the construction labor for the building of the World Trade Center in the 1970s, as well as a lot of the new financial towers in Jersey City shown here in the 2000s, was supplied by Mohawk steel workers who have rightly derived great pride from this contribution. In order to perform this labor, they were not only traveled weekly, usually by nightly bus on Sundays from their homes on the Askenaswe Reservation, crossing the border between the United States and Canada. So not only did they do this, but they also used this occasion to refuse at every passage to declare themselves citizens either of Canada or the United States, provoking a weekly confrontation with border bureaucrats in order to insist on the integrity of their governance and sovereignty. So the participation of Iroquois steel workers in this most American of architectural myths should not be separated from their more quiet quotidian struggle to activate and articulate their rights as members of reserve nations. So new narratives need to be written, and the narrative I've just recounted was written not by an architectural historian, but by our colleague in the anthropology department, Audra Simpson, a very beautiful book, influential, called Mohawk Interrupted, and I encourage you to read it. And this is the border crossing that these um, steel workers performed. New narratives need to be written, and that's good news because we are writers in this room. Um, we're here to celebrate this book, uh, Writing Architectural History, um, and I'm very impressed that the, uh, Michael Golick said it's a remarkable editorial achievement, if only he knew. Um, it's a book edited by three persons, but it's also a project that was brought through the Aggregate Architectural Collaborative. So there's a number of roving people in this room and probably on the screen who took part. Um, my job is just to introduce everybody and thank you for joining us. I also want to thank the team at the Buell for helping this uh, happen um, and uh, GSAP IT. And I don't want to take too much of your time, but I just want to maybe set the mood by saying one thing, which is that writing is back. Writing and architecture is back. Um, there's a growing number of venues where we're being asked to write, both online and in print. Uh, stories, reviews, critiques, discourse, debates, petitions. There's a lot of writing going on. There's growing demand, too, in architectural schools. Uh, historian theory people are increasingly being asked to, if maybe their uh, students can write about their studio projects, can we teach them to do that? Um, for the past 20 years, there was a kind of turn towards the exhibition or the research book. And today, architects and scholars are increasingly being asked simply to write. Um, so this is great. 
At the same time, with increasing demand comes uh, increasing pressures and renewed dangers. I'll cite just one, which is probably in all of your inboxes. There's an email from an architectural press, this is going to be anonymous, which is promoting very heavily a book, a nice book, written about one architect in the form of a monograph by one artist, which says, it's, it's a great book. This is a quote from a newspaper journalist. It is not like any other book on architecture I have read, and that's a really good thing, <laughs> a very good thing. So there's a challenge there, and one way to think about this book, it's not exactly, it's not the only way to think about it, and I'm sure the conversation will get much more technical and, and um, disciplinary, but one way to think about it is that this book takes up that challenge. So we write, how do we do that? Um, and how should uh, historians brace themselves for the fact that what they do is right? So um, what I'll do is I'll just introduce the three editors who are here, then they will, I've asked them to each make a little statement, and then I will introduce Matthew Jones. He will speak, give a response, and then in a debate-like fashion, we will all sit and, um, and uh, discuss. Um, Shannon Mattern, who was supposed to join us as well, um, uh, her semester has taken a turn for the more busy, and she has had to bow out, but don't worry, we, we have promised her that she will have to be part of our pro programming in the fall. So I'll start with Danny. Danny Abramson is a professor of history, of architectural history. Is that your title? Ar professor of architectural history and director of architectural studies at Boston University. His most recent book is Obsolescence in Architectural History. He, his current work relates to the architecture of American government centers, citizenship, the state, and capitalism since 1900. Small book. Zainab Chalik Alexander is an architectural historian who teaches at Columbia's Department of Art History. She's the author of Kinesthetic Knowing, that's a 2017 book. She's an editor of Grey Room and the director of Columbia's uh, Center for Comparative Media, and her new book is on imperial data. And Michael Osman is an associate professor in the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA where he currently directs the MA and PhD programs in architectural history. He is the author of Modernism's Visible Hand and is working currently on the political economies of construction. So please, I let you three uh, join me, and please join me in welcoming them. No, you, you, when you speak, you stand, no? You could. prepared some three minutes <laughs> of comments. Um, thank you for hosting us here. It's a wonderful pleasure to see all of you um, old friends and colleagues. Um, I thought I would just give a few words of introduction to the book um, and then hand it over to Zainab. And then I think Zainab will hand it over to Danny. So I'm trying to um, really speak to the book's formulation as a project, and um, I think that um, maybe most importantly is the way in which it, uh, over the course of several years, I think from the 2015 when we began deliberating the project um, until just uh, a few months ago when it came out, um, it went through many iterations and many formats. And so I wanted to speak to that a little bit um, and then uh, and how that actually uh, influences very much how we think of the project and, um, and its um, conceptualization. So um, actually the project began uh, as two syllabi. Um, and we were workshopping syllabi, which is something that we do at aggregate, but not as much now as we may have done with, in our kind of enthusiastic youth. Um, uh, the idea, I think, was uh, about uh, uh, taking teaching uh, seriously as a scholarly practice, and especially teaching scholars um, uh, to be scholars. And so the two syllabi, one was on evidence and one was on narrative. <laughs> So um, it was a, a nice combination. Um, and actually, one had been already tested, and the other one hadn't yet been tested. Um, and in their uh, 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 joining, uh, we, uh, two of us, uh, two of the three editors, uh, decided, OK, well, we should make an SAH session based on this problem of evidence and narrative. And in that session, it was conceptualized as really kind of a feedback. Uh, do these two 
projects intersect at, in ways in architecture that we that we hadn't anticipated or that um, that find new venues. And I think we collected some five papers or something like that and realized, yeah, we have a project. What was so exciting also is that the JSH at the time was uh, going to do a special issue on evidence. So they were collecting field notes from various scholars, including um, Mabel, uh, Irene, and Charles, who wrote uh, a field note on their uh, edited volume on race and modern architecture at the same time that Danny and I wrote one on evidence and narrative. Um, so that was an interesting experience also because it, this is moving from a format of then workshopping a syllabus, teaching a syllabus, um, an SAH session, feedback from the SAH session, submitting an essay to JSAH, getting feedback from Pat Morton, and then um, realizing that the project, if, it, if we were gonna extend it, we'd need to extend it in many different ways. Um, thinking about its interdi the interdisciplinarity of our field. Um, and so we ran a workshop at um, BU and then another one at the Clark, thinking also in this case, I think, again, to the project's formulation, is really about moving from institution to institution and seeing how the different institutions themselves impact the work and the thinking and the kinds of feedback we were receiving. Um, and then, uh, at that point, we'd, I think, collected something like 23 authors or something like this, um, 24 maybe, or 25 even, and then some, of course, didn't submit. Um, but um, we came close to not submitting ourselves to St. Um But, <laughs> um, but uh, I guess the, that story as a kind of preamble to the project is really just to say that um, the at what makes this a kind of aggregate project, I mean, you can see that it's got the aggregate the architectural history collaborative is that it is that that process of moving from institution to institution or moving from format to format or moving from um, medium to medium as it were um, what uh, was a reflexive process and it was a process that solicited feedback um, and that when we conceptualized the book finally after having collected the essays writing the introduction as you always do last um, I would say uh, and this is really a segue to Zainab's few minutes here, which is the, the project wasn't really about method. Um, and that's something that Zainab's gonna talk about. It, it became, as Lucia said, about writing. And so um, with that, I'll just transfer it to her. It's not good. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, well, thank you so much. First of all, thank you, Lucia. Thank you, everyone at Peel. And thank you, my dear, dear um, fellow editors. That uh, It's been a wonderful um, experience, especially during the pandemic. It was sessions of therapy more than anything yeah. else working with you. So as Michael said, this um, volume probably looks like it's uh, a call for rethinking the question of method in architectural history. So I'd like to take a few minutes to elaborate on what that might mean. Historically speaking, remember, Method is a word associated with the demarcation of the modern disciplines. At the turn of the 20th century, constellations of disciplines at Western research universities were rearranged according to something called method, as opposed to object. Both a sociologist and architectural historian say might study the city, but they will do so using different methods arranging particulars and uh, generals in markedly different ways. Because we still inhabit that epistemic universe, an epistemic universe in which method is the distinguishing mark of disciplinarity, any talk of method these days has the ring of a call to disciplinary orthodoxy. Even on occasions when a plurality of methods is allowed, or even encourage. And here I want you to think of the notorious methods course that lists feminist, Marxist, post-colonial perspectives in order one week after the other, but only after the foundational texts of the discipline have been studied. In fact, one could argue method implicitly assumes the necessity of a foundationalist epistemology and calls for methodological innovation for the sake of methodological innovation. 
So that's why I want to make sure we convey, as the editors, the message that while we're very much hoping that writing architectural history will be used pedagogically, in seminars that may still be called methods, it's pointedly not a demand for method. Or perhaps more precisely, it's not a demand for methodological discipline. We made an observation in the introduction that given its peculiar place within the university, architecture, architectural history demonstrates an ad hoc interdisciplinarity. To be clear, we're not complaining. It's this position, we think, that allows us to make the case in the book that our call is for thinking seriously about working philosophies rather than hard methods. What does this mean? Hopefully it doesn't mean dodging the uh, question of disciplinarity, rather talking about working philosophies allows us to bypass the more abstract and arguably more idealist meanings of the term method. It allows us to elaborate on its more mundane meanings so that we can play clo pay close attention to procedures, to protocols, and techniques that we use knowingly or unknowingly, that we invent or inherit, inherit from our discipline as we write architectural history. So this is genu genuinely a book about writing architectural history. Which is why we structure the introduction as a series of open questions. What counts as evidence for architectural history? What is an archive? What are the ethical implications of privileging one kind of evidence or one kind of archive over another? What if your archive is too large or too little? Or as the case may be for some of our uh, collaborators in the volume, non-existent. What ideologies do narratives produce or counter narratives? How do, you, how do you write a history with oral as opposed to written sources, with myth and fiction as opposed to fact? Some of our questions, in fact, were even more mundane, more practical. What does it mean to start your text with a general statement as opposed to an anecdote? What do you put in the subject position of a sentence? What kind of work do your footnotes do, et cetera, et cetera? Any answer that we as editors may have provided to these questions in the introduction was by ostension. That is by pointing to the work of our collaborators in the rest of the volume. <clears throat> so in the time that we have left, Danny will say a, a few words precisely about that, the breadth of our uh, collaborators' approach. Thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to follow Michael and Zainab and to be their partners. Um, and thank you to Lucia for having us and to the Buell staff for hosting all of this. Um, I'll continue with what Zainab said and talk a little bit about the breadth of practices, kind of the content of the book itself. In some ways, um, in terms of practices, there's much that continues. Um, architectural history's conventional writing practices that were implemented, um, if somewhat self-critically. A section of pairings and comparisons, which is one of our practices, putting things in chronology, focusing on materials. But there were other practices as uh, constituting this ad hoc interdisciplinarity, practices of reasoning and analysis that in the book by our collaborators are referenced and even actually borrowed by them uh, to do architectural history. Um, for example, uh, composing works of uh, following that of literary analysis or of autobiography or of mathematical reasoning or cartography, and especially in a book that takes evidence as one of its themes, many of the contributors were operating out of the practices of legal reasoning and legal history. It follows then from this kind of ad hoc interdisciplinarity and breadth of practices that there would also be a breadth of evidence present in the book. Of course, there are buildings and drawings, photographs and maps, 
but there are also mathematical formulas and tables, data sets and dust, tree rings, and a lot of court records. The breath also encompassed the scale at which the evidence was presented. There are are bricks and books. Of course, there are buildings, cities, regions, and even the planetary. But even from the smallest scale of coins up until the scale of continents as well. The geographies then that our collaborators focused on also uh, showed a breadth. From the very local to look at a particular site in Venice, to the scale of the globe, from the South Atlantic to Pakistan, Caribbean to Kenya, Iraq, Kosovo, and elsewhere. The chronology also is fairly broad. It doesn't go back earlier than the medieval, but we were glad to have contributors talking on medieval and Renaissance architecture up to the very contemporary. Along with those breadth of scales, of practices, of chronologies and evidence, what also emerged with the breadth of different subject agents and agencies. Of course, again, they're architects and planners and historians, but they're also felons and forgers, revolutionaries and refugees, astronomer, anthropologists, and corporate bodies like courts and companies also figure as important agents in architectural history. So writing architectural history was and is, as Michael and Zainab have explained, a collective exploration into the past, present, and future of architectural history writing. Of all its breaths, one of the most important, as Michael has explained, has been the formats in which architectural history writing can take place. Not just how it's been done, but how it might be done. Not just in scholarship, but as Michael said, in teaching. And not just by individuals, but in ever widening groups of people. And so in that spirit, we're very much looking forward to today's event or format, which is to us a natural and welcome continuation of the project as it has been conceived all along, an opportunity for exploration and conversation amongst those of you and us interested in writing architectural history. Thank you very much and look forward to the rest of the afternoon. Okay, so thank you, you three. And now I'm very pleased that um, Matthew Jones, Matt Jones, friend of aggregate, but also um, sort of eminence and incredibly broad, um, uh, with an incredibly broad uh, expertise um, who is joining us. So James, I mean, James, Matthew L. Jones is the James R. Barker Professor of Contemporary Civilization at Columbia University, where he focuses on the history of science and technology in early modern Europe and on recent information technologies. Um, His book from Chicago in 2016 was Reckoning with Matter, Calculating Machines, Innovation and Thinking about Thinking from Pascal Pascal to Babbage. And he's working on a new book with Chris Wiggins called How Data Happened. And we can't wait for that to happen, actually, so we can all read it. Uh, So please um, join me in welcoming Matt Jones. Okay, thank you for uh, inviting me. And this is in, indeed the case. It was a you know extraordinary privilege uh, to to read to read the the, the volume uh, today. And so, as I understand it, my job is to spend the next four hours summarizing all of the papers. Um, so, uh, with a, a long prologue. No, but I won't do any of that at all. I wanted to begin uh, with well, being a historian with an end note. And late in the book in part of an extraordinary essay about refugee camps, there is this amazing note. And there's a lot of reasons to call attention to this. One, that for all the luminous writing in this, it remains anchored in powerful ways 
with scholarly practices that solve epistemological and other kinds of problems at the very moment that it challenges many of those. And so in this moment, footnote or endnote nine of Siddiqui's essay, uh, she notes that the documents were profoundly ephemeral. They were printed on paper with an emulsion that could no longer hold ink, and she held each leaf up directly up to a lamp to study embossed traces of the printed text. Due to the state of the documents, she notes, I may be the last researcher able to make out the words on these pages. This is all the more poignant given that the essay is so fundamentally concerned, as are many of the essays, with the rarity of the evidence. And it's also primarily, and it's extraordinary in its emphasis on the ephemerality, but also the everyday quality of the technique that she's reading it that belongs among a whole range of, of techniques. And above all, it, about the challenge that this evidence itself might dissipate, that it collect, might never not be able to provide for the collectivity again. I'm gonna come back to this uh, several times, but I was really struck by it. So what I'm gonna talk about, and I'm only gonna talk about uh, for 10 minutes, I hope, um, if that, I'm gonna talk about five major things that I saw as I was reading this book as an outsider. I'm gonna talk about fears, epistemic fears. I'm gonna talk about absences, productive ones. I'm gonna talk about rarefication, which I'll explain. I'm gonna talk probably most about technique, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about story. Um, and I must say, because there are 20 essays plus an introduction, I cannot do justice. And to those authors who are in the room, if I should not mention your essay, it is no sense of a lack of admiration, it is a question of space. So, fear. Why fear? Well, uh, essays particularly on the first half of, oh, I should take this off. Um, someone should have said something. Um, essays in the first half um, re frequently refer to uh, one of the sort of grand books in my field, Objectivity by Rainey Dastin and Peter Gallison. And one of the most striking things that happens in Objectivity, which is a book that I adore to teach, um, because it is at once so generative and so problematic. They note on page 372 that all epistemology begins in fear. Now, most people who read the book, uh, well, a lot of people who, it's, a, it's one of these classic books that's cited everywhere and rarely uh, as thought as carefully as, as this volume does. But I take this very seriously. And, I, and, and so I wanted to begin by thinking about the fears that animate this book. So as I was reading it as a very interested outsider, someone who occasionally reads architectural history, even more often is privileged to have graduate students in the history of architecture here at Columbia and from the New York area. Um, I was curious about what the fears were, what was animating. And it took me in some sense until page 258 <laughs> to realize one of the fears, and maybe I'm wrong about but um, on page 258, uh, we, which is an extraordinary essay uh, about hab habeas corpus, which I can't recommend enough to you, um, and is one of the essays that most clearly speaks to historians about architecture. Um, the author, Lisa Abert Thompson, notes the danger and fears about the priority of architectural drawings as the foundational technical practice around which. And once I realized this, I saw that everywhere resonating. As a technical practice that grounds, even if people resist it. Now, a second fear is something that the kids might call FOMO, the fear of missing out. And I mean this in a serious way. Resonating through the volume is the fear that architectural historians might be missing out on alternative evidentiary practices. And again, this is, at the very end of the volume, Hyde notes this, that perhaps law offers evidentiary practices that we ought to think about adopting, not slavishly, not as master methods, but it's really, but so I mean it seriously, a fear of missing out that other people might have something to offer. And then also resonating through the volume is a fear of prior narrative forms. And again, uh, I realized um, in reading Eric's essay uh, uh, that monograph means something different to people in art history. But fear of both the monograph 
and of the social historical totalizing account, fear of those narrative forms, fear of the kinds of things that Hayden White makes us to think. So I see these as productive and powerful fears through them. Now, along the way, I also noted a lot of things that were missing, and I was happy about it, that were productive. Just as the fears were productive, there were, there were two, there were productive absences. There was not a lot of things that I've often become accustomed to, particularly among uh, um, uh, humanists who style themselves in some sense more methodologically oriented. We didn't, you don't see in this volume a lot of different kind of what I will call facile moves. You don't see a facile materialism. You don't see a facile privileging of practice over the theoretical, though there's a deep suspicion of the theoretical. It's not laid out this way. It's not the, doesn't have the tone, which is so replete in a lot of our prose as humanists and makes us so irritating to others, rightly so, that we always already knew of our own epistemic superiority and thus we are going to proceed in this way. There's, there's likewise no facile recourse, and boy was this a breath of fresh air to neoliberalism. Right, the 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 uh, fear of social reductionism led to an almost not that there was not an engagement with the market uh, structures, the bad the government structures of today. That's, they saturate the essays, but not in such naive and idiotic terms. More deeply, there was a, a striking absence of the epistemological strongman that we like as humanists often to put. Um, there was not that focus on constantly renouncing claims to objectivity rather than concrete investigation of claims of evident nature. So in the chapter on tabulation from Zenith, you see at once a deep, profound suspicion that we have of the artificiality of data. And then a recognition that that story is important to tell but is a starting place, right? And it's a starting place that is essential uh, for uh, us both as scholars of these things, but was essential also to the people that were writing them. The, the most interesting practices are not those that are caught in naive claims of objectivity. People may voice those, but to spend all of our time investigating the voicing of claims of objectivity is often to miss the activity such as the activity that the volume engages in. Rarification, so this is a term um, that I take from, of all things, an obscure essay by a great uh, French ancient historian who wrote this um, amazing piece called Foucault Revolutionizes History. It's a little unclear whether it has anything to do with Foucault, but it's an amazing piece of prose. Um, and uh, rarefication, uh, I take to be, in two sense, against forms of plenitude. Um, one is, a pushing against the plenitude of evidence, the plenitude of evidence that, say, a diplomatic historian believes that he or she is able to have in order to reconstruct results, the kind of thing that modern US historians frequently think they have, and that it's clear that certain kinds of privileged architectural historians believe that they can have, either through certain kinds of uh, uh, drawing documentation or proper forms of context, whether they're economic, social, and cultural. The volume pushes against the possibility of that and the dangers of uh, pushing on that. And then secondly, and, and rarefication meaning a blowing up, as it were, of the sense of the solidity of that evidence, both to question those domains where evidence is uh, produced regularly in archival forms and stored, and to recognize the necessity when approaching evidential bases, which are necessarily going to require um, modes of working for much greater forms of uncertainty. The second kind of rarefication, of course, is the breaking of the solidity of the self-evident, and that is what Vain claims that Foucault does brilliantly, that Foucault takes apart both, uh, both things like ideology, but also the solidity of, uh, 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 of apparent material practices. And I think that's one of the extraordinary moves that we see throughout here. Um, uh, we see it in particularly in, in, in the opening uh, essay on Haiti, but also the remarkable essays that I've already mentioned 
on the refugee camps and an extraordinary piece on dust and so by Musafir. We see um, the way in which this rarefication then comes to be narrativized. And I think this is a, a primary thing. So I'll come back to the literary forms of this, but one facet of the rarefication is, of course, a recognition of the limits of evidence and the need for non-certain forms of reasoning. And it leads, I think, in some sense, and I wonder how self-consciously this is, to many of the authors uh, producing something that in some sense is almost like a detective story, taking on the epistemological thing. Now, Carl Ginsburg, uh, the great historian now at UCLA, has told the history of this alternative mode of, of investigation with the knowledge of the particular. Um, uh, but I think that's very much at stake here. It's not accidental that that's a powerful literary mode that exposes both the, the search for evidence, um, but also the probabilistic moves that are necessary if you are going to talk about anything that is rarefied at all. Now, yeah? Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, sorry my Zoom friends. No, usually I wander around. It's taken incredible self-discipline. Uh, so once I was giving, once I, I'm sorry, once I was giving a lecture and uh, I was mic'd and so I could walk around and it's the first time ever they project the Twitter feed on the lecture. So in real time, it's so like people trash talking me. Um, but there was speculation on exactly how many, how many steps I had taken in the course of this. Um, okay, so I will attempt to be uh, better mic'd. Um, so, uh, now, one thing that was striking, an absence that I'm not at all critical of, but in traditional narratives of the development of the history profession itself, there's a great historical and epistemological crisis that occurs in the 17th century. And the answer to that crisis is not a philosophical answer. It's not epistemological closure at all. But it rather stems from the hooking together of the whole range of the so-called auxiliary disciplines of history, from numismatics to diplomatics and other sorts of an entire set of uh, practices which had been developed um, in, in extraordinary ways throughout the Renaissance and hooking those and connecting them into, uh, into uh, historical writing. Um, this get that 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 dangerous generative moment is often lost in the sort of Rankian narratives, and it's often lost in the kind of um, uh, classic moves of someone like um, um, uh, a, a White, who think in largely an epistemological vein about history, has history as something that is about uh, uh, what someone I'll quote in a second calls noble interpretation. So. That leads me to think from the moves of the volume, which are about f encouraging us to think about rarefication, to the role throughout on what I'm gonna call technique. Um, and here I think is one of the sort of things that I think is so extraordinary um, through and through that runs from the chapters on law, the chapters on um, in the middle of the volume, an extraordinary set of chapters on how to think about pairing as a technique in art and architectural history and not just taking the uh, approach that it's sort of epistemologically so clearly wrong. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna posit, and I don't know if this is true, that the fear, the anxiety uh, about around that mastery of reading drawings is interestingly channeled here, not into the abandonment of technique, but to an explosion of potential techniques that might be valuable. Techniques all understood to be uh, um, uh, probabilistic, uncertain, but nonetheless somewhat useful. So uh, Michel de Certeau, in a part of, of an essay that's really widely read called The Writing of History, in a section that is very rarely read, um, said something really extraordinary. Now, he was reacting, and it's a very strange essay, in that he, he's excited by Foucault, and he's also excited by like the first glimmers of cleometrics. And the cleometrics, that is, the counting of signatures, it's a project that it collapses, it's awful, it's tales about it are told to historians when they go to bed so they don't be, they're not bad sorts of people. And digital humanities has done, tried to get over this heritage. But Certeau, uh, puts the use of computers in this incredibly interesting framework. Now, he is writing primarily about 
the French university, but I think it's an extraordinarily useful. He writes, insofar as the university is foreign to practice and technicality, and therefore a part of the university, right? Everything that places history and rapport with techniques is classified as an auxiliary his science. Now, as I said, there's a long narrative that connects auxiliary sciences with the possibility of doing history in the 17th and 18th century. Formerly, he continues, this meant epigraphy, papyrology, paleography, diplomatics, today musicology, folklorism, computer science. History would only begin with the noble speech of interpretation. It would finally be an art of discourse delicately erasing all traces of labor. I, I think if you've read the volume, you know why I'm quoting this, because at every level, um, the concerns of this are everywhere. The volume is fundamentally concerned with questions of noble interpretation, but is constantly tacking back to those forms of technique or auxiliary sciences, as Surteau says, that ought to be looking at. So the volume very much is much more interested in evidential practices rather than bluster about representation. It's much more interested in what one um, uh, comment, uh, one of the authors refers to as a kind of sensuous thinking than epistemological straw men. And this is deeply connected to that push against the facile critique I mentioned before. That facile critique is not wrong. People making ridiculous claims about objectivity and representational knowledge, they are wrong, but we know that, you know? That story has been told, but often that's a surface of a much more interesting practice. And that's indeed what we see uh, throughout the volume. And we see it in two ways, um, at least. One, we see the cataloging of quite remarkable sets of practices that uh, you all, and uh, as architectural historians and, uh, and those of us who are mere historians, ought to take a look at. That is, forms of proxies for kinds of knowledge that we might not otherwise be able to have. And thus we have extraordinary chapters on the utility of thinking about uh, tree rings, the amazing chapter on carbonization, uh, a reflective chapter that considers the sort of way that shape files will bring into view things you might not see, not as a scientific practice, but as a practice of engaging in technologies such that one, visibility becomes possible. The chapter of the book very much ends with the utility of different approaches from legal precisely to bring in things into visibility. None of these uh, is presented as a master method. And indeed, um, much of the richness of the volume comes from the fact that they are coupled with chapters that are making us think about these, the emergence of these evidentiary practices as probabilistic domains. And thus, we see the constitution in a non-reductionist way of these kinds of technologies. And I think the four chapters on pairing bring this out really beautifully. Zainab's chapter, which I've already mentioned, on um, tabulation. Again, these are all profoundly, well, we, for lack of a better word, might call iffy representational practices, but they're powerful. They're not the royal road to truth. But there is no royal road to truth. If we abandon just denouncing representational models and we move on from there, then we're going to get somewhere, both in the historical develop in understanding historical development of different evidential practices and in assembling evidential practices that may enable us to overcome the fears and without falling into those things that are absent. And I'll say um, this is broadly true, I think, of a lot of the most remarkable work that's happening. Uh, in, in the history of the sciences and more broadly. In the volume, um, you can see the connection between, as it were, the climate realism that is now saturating many of the humanities and that has pushed back against the two simple. But I, you also see this in sort of remarkable work that's been done on cartography, um, uh, where scholars have noted the extent to which the very critical, the battery of critical techniques that humanists claim to be their own are central indeed to the transformation of the discipline itself in recent years, that we are all acting as if people were still writing the awful things they were writing in 1949. And in fact, that's not the case in cartography, and it's also not the case um, in the self-reflexive quality of climate science. Okay, I'm talking way too long, and I promise that I will cease to do so very quickly, if this works. Hello? Oh, there. It only had one word on it, story. Okay. 
Now this, I, I feel like I'm gonna fall into almost a subcritical uh, domain, but it is, the, the striking things about this volume is that it is everywhere anxious about narrative and it's replete with narrative. Um, and I love that about it. Uh, it's incredibly writerly. Um, throughout, and it's writerly in different genres. There are writerly in the genres that guide you carefully through the historiography and make you see in a luminous way previous answers um, that were that built upon disciplinary configurations. And there's others that are far less, uh, that, that are far less academic, in, in traditionally academic in form. And it strikes me as a, a, as a great strength. So they're anxious about narrative and replete with narratives, but they're also, and this I think is unusual, it is a profoundly memorable set of essays. It is filled, it begins, the first two essays are profoundly anxious about the anecdote. So as historians, we teach our students to begin the weird anecdote that then motivates uh, an inquiry that you alone are going to solve. And there's good reasons for that, right? There's a good reason for that specificity. The volume begins with uh, asking us to think differently about that. And yet, throughout, whether it's uh, in this unbelievable moment of the ephemeral facts thing, uh, the, 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 these extraordinary, an extraordinary es essay on dust and silt, um, as well as a whole series of architectural formations, which I think are disciplinary central to you, to thinking about uh, dendrochronology and other kinds of things. So I guess that gets me back to uh, the Sertoa because there we have noble interpretation and it's cast against technique. But what I was so struck, and that's not really what I wanted to, I would love to hear the panel discuss, is the extent to which that is a self-conscious part of the labor and work we want to do. That noble interpretation, far from being something that we ought to analyze uh, exclusively on a theoretical, in a theoretical register, which much of the postmodernist critiques of history have long done, and we know that story, but the extent to how we think about practice and technique and narrativization and the diversity of it. Um, and I mean this in a very concrete way, and I was so happy that um, the editors talked about this, is that this was produced in a pedagogical context, and I would love to know, because this is a volume, I'm currently involved in editing something with 19 papers, and it's a mess, and none of the papers talk to one another, yeah. and um, uh, and so to, to have something that is as coherent as this is without being overdetermined, um, I think is an extraordinary achievement, but it's not an achievement purely in the realm of theoretical expression, but it is a realm in sensuous practice, and I think that's where I, I would sort of like to, to end by uh, inviting a discussion that is very forthright about that. So I want to thank all of the all of the authors, uh, Michael Zinnip and um, uh, David, for uh, for putting this together, which must have been extraordinary work, and, um, and and Jordan for making this possible. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, incredible and. Um, and thankfully, I'm not the one to respond to it, but these people are. <laughs> um, so maybe, is it okay if I sort of open the stage for you? I, I, I could imagine that Danny would want to respond to the questions about uh, writerliness and uh, Michael about the sort of herding together of cats and Zeynep about epistemology, but you know, that's just my guess. So I, maybe I leave you to have a kind of discussion and then I have some questions in my pocket and I'm sure people have them too. And by the way, authors are sort of strewn throughout in some also on Zoom, so. Matt, thank you. Okay, Matt, thank you very much. That was really incredibly generous um, and perceptive uh, response, and I wish we'd had you write the introduction <laughs> to the book. Um, do you mind repeating what you said at the end, just what you wanted to have us address um, so that I can kind of think more deeply about that and we can, because I do want to try to answer that question, but I think I didn't catch all of it. Um, yeah, so I, I it was, it's, it's really in some sense a banal question we rarely enough do. That is, what in fact in practice do we do to encourage as a collective and then individual authors to um, confect things that engage in all of these registers 
and yet uh, communicate as powerfully as they'd like. But really concretely, how do we think about doing this with graduate students who, uh, but as well as, as sort of colleagues? Um, and how did you do it? And um, yeah, and, and both in a, in a sort of deeply practical way, but also how is it that you retain that mix of, as it were, very theoretical high-handedness with incredible legibility? Um, I'll try to say something about the practice of it. I think the first part relates to what Michael was saying about it being an aggregate project, which is the kind of the repetition, getting together in different formats, um, letting people do the work that they were going to be doing on their own anyway, but trying to encourage them to think about the questions we were asking. So. Um, by repeatedly getting together and talking, I think that we hopefully set up a situation in which we trusted each other, we trusted them, and they trusted us, and it was just a lot of nagging, <laughs> I think, um, and asking people to keep on considering the questions of evidence and narrative, and so that when we edited the pieces, we left alone the things that we were in expert in, which was kind of the content, of what they were doing, but just kept on pushing them to try to address it. And then um, when we wrote the introduction, that too was done basically as a group among all 23 of us, everyone who could participate. And I think, again, that helped people to see when they were reviewing their essays to do so, and then we paired people up to do that. And so it just, it was a lot of work but it was joyful work because we were all in it together. So I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but it just was a lot of different stages. And I think, as Zainab said, the three of us really enjoyed and wanted to keep working together too. So it was never, it was never a labor to do that, and we hope among the other contributors too. So that's the practical part. It just was putting in the time, but also just letting people do what they were gonna do anyway and recognizing that and not trying to force people to do more than they could. Could you say, uh, I mean, one of the char characteristic facets of the volume is, I would say, generic innovation with unrelenting rigor. I, and I'm sort of, and how, I mean, how did you, did you, is it just that you picked the right people? How did you cultivate that particular, how did you encourage that generic exploration without it exploding it into, you know, pure, you know, older style, like 90s style, you know, self-flagellation about the inadequacy of all knowledge or something. <laughs> uh, I think maybe part of the reason, and I, I won't take credit for that, but I think our students um, had never been in Britain to try to talk about their, is this, does this work? Yeah, yeah. Like an ice cream cone. Right? <laughs> yeah, a little closer, like this. So. Uh, we have, it's true, we have um, colleagues who do amazing work. And I think, I mean, we can talk about the historical reasons for that, but for whatever it is, it is like anthropology, architectural history has given this space to do the kind of, you know, rigorous interdisciplinary, I don't know what you mean by generic exploration, <laughs> but I think, I, I don't take credit for that. Yes, we have this great, um, way of workshopping things and you should come prepared uh, with a notepad and a very open mind and you should be able to take any kind of criticism. But I don't think we can take credit at all for that. I think architecture, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be sarcastic in that particular way, but that is why I think we need to do, whatever reason, and I'm sure the audience is an awesome reason about this, architectural history seems to be the <laughs> emancipated <laughs> state. I was, I was going to answer, um, and that's, uh, by the way, it was awesome. It was a, sounded like a much better book when you read it. Um, the, I was going to answer your question in a way that I think maybe Danny was hinting at, but I want to kind of, the, the language, uh, we make distinctions between teaching and research. Uh, every time I think we put our materials together for review or whatever, like, we think of teaching as some kind of like more close to service and maybe research more like about ourselves. And I think that 
um, what I realized from your comments actually is that the that kind of firewall or false dichotomy between those two acts, which we are constantly distinguishing them, uh, in a, in a weird way, the editorial process itself moves back and forth from a kind of research practice to a teaching practice, and in a certain way, it become makes them indistinguishable, um, and uh, I I think the the ed editors are learning from the research what the ed what the edited volume is about and the researchers are learning what so there's there's this reciprocity that i think is feels like teaching and uh, it, i should say not because it's not like one directional it's bidirectional teaching and i think what the, so that workshop which we constantly use that word that that's that feeling that's that sensuous thing that i think you're pointing to so yeah, if, I don't know if that's an explanation as much as it's kind of like maybe like a language game that we've been playing that denies us access to that practice. I was going to, I think that sounds like from the experience of a contributor, that sounds right. <laughs> There's a hand periodically in your inbox, like massaging things, and I'm like, oh, and you kind of massage back. Um, I was going to um, maybe rephrase, I think your answer is exactly right, that there is a sense that architectural history has the capacity to structure itself. Nevertheless, there's a choice, and I think this is part of your question about the coherence. There's a choice about how to do that. How, and I think that the book is a horizontal coherence across fields that are not speaking to each other, or, uh, sorry, research that is not speaking to each other. And that's different than a choice, let's say, to have a vertical integration or something like that where all topics you know people are experts in the same field or they're trying to get at the same literature or the same aspect of the bibliography etc can you maybe talk about that like how that's different how making a horizontal volume is very different than making a volume that's vertical of which there are also some great ones so this is an answer to Zainab's point about those great volumes edited volumes coming out in architecture which tend to be vertically addressing one object or subject or area or something like that. So this is different than that. Any? Um, uh, to use a sports metaphor, I think we were looking for the best athletes in the draft. Um, that is, we. I think what attracted us was essays that were really. As a contributor, I'm offended by that. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be. I'm just. I'm joking. Um, I think we felt, to repeat what Zainab says, that architectural history is in a really great place, especially here, I think at Columbia, and I can say that because I don't have any institutional affiliation, that there's an extraordinary um, uh, group of people who've been trained here, and um, as well as elsewhere. And so that when we um, received proposals for contributions or were looking for contributions, we weren't looking for that kind of vertical integration. I think we were looking for people who were doing what we thought was complicated work with a certain degree of self-reflexivity, and that hope, and we were hopeful that we could get those contributors to think harder about issues of evidence and narrative. Um, and so it um, ended up being very dispersed um, and difficult then to kind of group together in the table of contents because it didn't have that vertical integration, but that was the wager we took at the beginning um, was that we were looking for things that were dispersed um, and that from the experience of governing by design, the first aggregate book did, maybe didn't have the opportunity to pull things together quite as much. We learned from that experience to try even harder this time to integrate the things together, to leave that dispersal in place and that horizont horizontality. Um, but then as, as Matthew's talking about, we've tried to put in more time uh, trying to thread things together. I just also the pedagogical um, impulse as well. As you uh, made your comments, I realized that you know, I only make edited volumes that are geared towards a particular uh, pedagogical audience. I, the previous edited volume I did was, I think, for MRX, really. For MRX, um, it's a Master of Architecture students who were in um, studio settings under a certain kind of pressure not to be engaged with history theories. I wouldn't in, attempt to engage them. And this actually is very much a methods. Uh, I mean, I've been teaching the pro-seminar in my department. This is how I teach classes here. 
people just didn't like it so much. <laughs> Some of them are here. <laughs> No, no, it, um, I, I'm, and it, this not a quibble, but I, I think that we we uh, we're like more like the Oakland A's than the Yankees, just to use. I don't know what those are. You should know. There's this there's a movie based on a book by Michael Lewis called Moneyball, and and it's and it's less so like the I think that the dis the discipline, as it were, of architectural history is less a kind of the you know Bernie Williams. Derek G. Like they're not like the. I think we are a more horizontal field that way. More like, and I, I I'll quote from your comments. A somewhat useful. Like I I I think that the that we I think that there's a sense. At, maybe it's also the youth of the field, like general youth, is that the sense that there is not as the the anxiety of influence is maybe less, and maybe then all, but that then new anxieties emerge. And and they're all somewhat useful, <laughs> you know. So maybe that's. But the you were right on to correct about the anxiety. <laughs> all the anxieties you had were your diagnostic is a hundred percent. You could make bets on this and get rich. The biggest anxiety being is this architecture really. <laughs> no, I think the the one of reading technical drawings, the question of reading the drawing as evidence. Um, I don't think anyone would have put their finger on that voluntarily, but you have read it, I think, correctly. Um, can I ask a sort of question that goes to that? Um, and it's a question kind of for both, because the when the objectivity book has traveled into architecture, I mean, this is one of, one of the influences in this book. And <clears throat> one of the ways in which it uh, is manifested in the introduction is that you've written about the importance of historical epistemology as a model. And it strikes me that that's slightly different in a field like the history of science, where epistemology, the production knowledge, is also the practice at stake. Scientists presumably know that they're producing knowledge. As opposed to architects, of course, many architects now, thankfully, know that they're also producing knowledge. But fundamentally, the architect, uh, in uh, the imagination, is one that produces buildings. And then the historian produces knowledge. And so. Historical epistemology actually has a slightly different valence in architectural history, um, notwithstanding, so aside from the pedagogical goal of this book, you know, this is about writing architectural history of history. So did you, this is a question for you, coming from the, you know, the seat the where historical, <laughs> not the real, I'm not making a reality gesture, I'm waving, I'm not saying the real thing. Did you feel that difference? And then to the editors, uh, what do we make of that? I think, what do I think? Um, I was not concerned, or I was not surprised to see that the idea that what would count as architectural history was pluralized. I sort of took it as what is likely to be true. What was likely to be true back then was the centrality of certain technical modes of interpretation, that that was the, like it didn't seem to me that the volume betrayed a worry about pluralism of the things that one might consider in architecture. Though I was often intrigued in narrative terms at the moment in which all of your authors stopped and said why this is architecture. So in the essay <laughs> on habeas corpus is really, no, no, there's an anxiety. And I, I could have marked every one of them. And I'm like, <laughs> here's the moment. And I can imagine an editorial voice being like, you have to say this. Um, <laughs> but I also like the tension associated with why it was that we were talking. I mean, I, I, I just, the, the heaviest essay is just sitting here w with me because it's also one in which the importance of architectural history to other domains of history is very clear. We didn't talk about this. I was going to ask you that it's some, but well, I'll get back to that in a second. Uh, uh, the, that, yes, there was always a moment in the reintroduction of why this was valid as a space, uh, as a space of, uh, as architecture. As to the question of knowledge versus the constant, so the history of science is ha in the midst of a 30 year, um, of a 30 year process of self-hate that knowledge is itself hate. 
and there's a massive disciplinary divide with the history of technology and that is so extreme that I once brought up Kant in front of historians of technology and they were like livid <laughs> that I should have done this because I had violated everything. Um, so, but more seriously, the, 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 there's been such a concentration on practice because science for so long was misapprehended that we now actually are having to work really hard to think about that differently. And so objectivity is controversial. It's, it's much more widely said and positively cited outside of my field. It's often discouraged. Often discouraged. Um, and, and it solves in the way that it works to both do something that is historical epistemology, which goes back to this project of being really contingent about the nature of truth and falsity, and then connects that to questions of the embodiment of the knower rather than social history, is a controversial and powerful set of moves that both brings knowledge back in um, and circumvents social history by virtue of the constitution of the virtues of people. I think it's extraordinary. It's underdetermined. I love teaching it because I love teaching books that are incredibly bold and problematic. Um, and and so, to, to, I mean, just to come to your question, I was, I guess, heartened everywhere to see at once critical self-reflection that was constituent, constructive, um, and so many essays that were about that process in, in place. Um, and so, yeah, your essay on decarbonization is so extraordinary. Oh, your essay, I'm so sorry. I know. I'm so sorry. Yours, your essay is on evaluation. I know. Uh, right. I will remember all these essays for approximately like, uh, well, in detail for like, you know, 27 hours. Um, but then that will stick with me. Yeah. So in your essay, there you see both of those processes happening, um, and I think that's one of the powerful moves uh, that absolutely. But perhaps it's because it's because I, it, my domain is always to think about the knowledge. Um, that it struck me as less foreign than it might other of your readers. Zainab? So, um, Please I, do I, this. I Zainab, if you don't do this, the people okay. on Zoom think you are so, in um, mine. On the question of historical, I don't know how uh, actually important, I mean, I guess Erickson's a narrative. Yes, it's about historical epistemology. You're right. But um, I agree with you. I mean, you just alluded to it. And I mean, it was a very powerful along with, I think, very yeah. <laughs> amazing. Um, I forget the, where it was published. But so, I mean, there is a sense in which historical epistemology, to the extent that it's equated with objectivity, is very narrow. And I think um, to the extent that, I mean, they talk about nothing. I mean, I also wrote the book, by the way. I teach it. I, um, I um, use it in my work. But my actual demand to the people in the audience were the ones who pointed out that actually it wasn't that objectivity was no longer historical, right? That that's in the part that they built an ISPR. I'm looking at you that one that they don't mention the fact that many of these so-called wonders come from the continent and another sort of identify the ways in which it doesn't come anywhere in the periphery of knowledge, right? So it's a kind of historical epistemology that's very, very um, self-enclosed, doesn't go anywhere near social history by any stretch of the imagination. But I don't think the potential of historical epistemology was fostered by um, um, Daphne Gallatin and these sort of um, wonders for the part. And in some ways, you could argue, sorry, you know, I know the um, movie belongs to your discipline, but uh, you know, in some ways, there are so many doors and so many opening up by historical epistemology that perhaps the narrative of the book is also that kind of Uh, just one comment that we got from Pat Morton, if you remember, was, um, is this a call for a new empiricism, remember? And I think we took that really seriously uh, as a, a kind of reminder, like, uh, we've been here before, maybe. Um, and and so uh, not, not moving away from the empirical, but understanding how, how it's somewhat useful uh, at getting out of the noble narrative, um, I think, 
Um, and then that we, I think, this is again to the MARC thing, um, and, and I think I'm, you know, Lucia and I still teach in architecture schools, you know. <laughs> but there is something about the, the sort of labor, uh, of professional labor, and this was written into the introduction somewhat, that the professional labor of the architect, uh, as, and, and Zainab said this in her, uh, in, in the, the design techniques book too, which is there's something about that process which has uh, of performing an act uh, like uh, like an ideological act, which in somehow in performing it, you're actually becoming a part of the apparatus. So like, uh, I don't remember if the quote is from like Althusser or Pascal. What, what was it? Uh, yeah, that one. Oh, okay. No, but what I'm saying is that there's something about the habituation of the, the habit, right? The habituate the and the practices of say, and this is to your question, of drawing, uh, which in a certain way become the sort of empirical register for some other thought practice, right? So, like, and and that back and forth, the presumption of diseño or whatever as like this long history of being able to make your ideas into things, um, I think that's, I think there's something disciplinary about that, you know, and I don't know. So I, I'm trying to answer your question yeah. by saying like, I think that we're dealing with knowledge practices as practices, as empirical, and, and we have habituated that as a discipline. Okay, I have a counterfactual. It's coming from Zoom. Uh, Philip Denny is asking a question. About biography, it's, um, it's to the left of the projector. <clears throat> so, um, Phil Denny uh, is asking about the role of biography, the, putting biography on the table, and he mentions that the the text, the book I was so I mentioned two books earlier. One is Mohawk the Interruptus by Interrupted by um, Audra Simpson, and then just now the book that is being promoted heavily, which is a very nice book by Justin Beale, is called. Sand Futures, I think, and it's about um, Minoru Yamazaki. It's a biography of Minoru Yamazaki. Of course, Justin Beale is not a historian in the traditional sense. He's an artist. He doesn't have a PhD. But nevertheless, it is a biography, and there's... And so the question is, with a notable exception of this book, which I would actually argue is not really in the same sort of uh, bookshelf, let's say, um, Biography and biographies seem to occupy only a marginal position in the recent writing of architectural history. Why is that? And this is counter to your understanding that there's a fundamental understanding everywhere that architecture is a knowledge producing practice. I think most people who are reading the Minori Yamazaki, uh, however much self-conscious as Justin Beale actually puts into the book, basically see it as a biography of an architect um, written by a sympathetic person who is also a creative human being. Um, so not knowledge production, but rather um, object production. And, and indeed, actually biography, I mean, Ijlal's um, text is a kind of biography. The, Ijlal is the author of the Dust and Silt essay. Um, so so wh why do you think that is? Is that, or is that coming back? The question about whether it's the maker or the, what's it, what is the question again? Why has biography, I suppose one of the questions is where is biography in this book maybe? Why is biography not? something that we teach in architecture school? Think of it this way. I make slides. I have to keep on captions on the slides. And I, every time I look at the caption, I wonder why it's Frank Lloyd Wright, Mark, and administration. I mean, it's a ridiculous uh, uh, proposition. That's why. It's sort of OK, biography is a ridiculous <laughs> proposition. <laughs> we have an answer. No, like to I think that's that's true. I, the other essay that I'd point to um, that uh, thinks about biography is Meredith Tenhors. Who's sitting right here. Um, and the fabrication of biography. Um, you know, and I what I'd say too is that I believe that biography is kind of re-entered through the back door through the oral history turn, which is not about the biography of the architect, but about the life story 
of an inhabitant or a user. So um, uh, it, it, it also comes back to, and these were things that Michael and Zainab and I talked about in the introduction, which is that desire for some kind of coherent subject, whether it's the monograph of a building, which is a kind of a biography or of the person. And, you know, you have to be, you have to think critically about what sort of narrative desire you are seeking by wanting to have a coherent subject, um, whether it's answer. biographical or monographic of a okay, building. Good. I have another answer for Philip. Um, it's not only that the biography, that the biography is, uh, feels absent maybe uh, on first blush, but also that I think another point, Danny, you made a really nice point in the introduction, um, where the biography of the, of the protagonist of the narrative often reflects back on the seeming coherence of the autobiography of the, of the writer, the historian. Um, and I think the Oslo piece actually is, is really good at uh, breaking that coherence of yourself and your protagonist, your story, Zabel or whatever, and, or Zabel's protagonist as well. So um, I was just thinking about uh, the fact that you co-authored with Forrest and we co-authored and then Paul co-authored with Ingo and that, and then there are three others. Like all of those might be answers to, to Philip too, which is that maybe the sense of the uh, complementary reinforcement of subjective coherence is fragmenting. And, and maybe that's an anxiety that he's got that we, <laughs> we're now talking no, about but that, that we're trying that we're like the therapists for no I mean that, <laughs> like here's how you might deal with that Philip okay so I that's the other answer the answer is that it's not absent at all it's um it has taken it has been split off into several it's been activated differently by different people when Meredith at the end of when we find the you know, frisson of finding out what really happens at the end of your essay, that's one use of biography, which is very different than the way that um, Ijlal um, motivates it in the way that Justin Beale does it. So one more question coming from the Zoom sphere, which is about style, and I think this might be, we have maybe 10 more minutes before people sort of are annoyed and want to go. Um, and so maybe if you have a question or two, I can take that. But first, uh, style. What is the role of style? And because, you know, Hayden White came up, and <coughs> you didn't bring him up, but what is the role of style in our, and not our, I, I'm assuming this person is not asking about architectural style, but writerly style. And especially when one writes about, yeah, we're just going through style, biography, <laughs> style, <laughs> object. Um, so writerly style, because we don't only write for our advisors um, but, and our students, but also for other people. Danny. I write for the people in this room to be understood by them. Um, I think we each have our own styles and those have to come naturally. I don't know what, you know, we read the people whom we like, we think hard about that. I think everyone contributed to the essay, was to the book was actually developing their own style of writing. Um, I really appreciate what Matt said about the interest in practice and technique and craft I think was important uh, to us too so I don't I don't have anything more I mean it's, it's just um, for someone like myself who's not trained in an art as an architect but has an undergraduate degree in writing that's the kind of the making that I'm uh, closest to but other people have different backgrounds I did notice one thing when you write with someone uh, your style Something happens to it. You I was going to say the same thing. And there's something beautiful about that. I have to let go of my uh, desire to conflict and my. Um, well, yeah, it's somehow it's, it's it's really nice to push yourself that way. I was going to say the same thing. I had to write with Forrest, who I had to. I got to write with Forrest, who is has a completely different voice and everything, and it came out completely differently. In addition to the methodological problem of how to convey scientific knowledge and and its history. Um, it, he's a great historian of science. He, he, he came up with all the best turns of phrases. So there was something, style, the new style is co-authored. 
<laughs> no, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's so you heard many it here first. Let's it go. And so often. Yeah. Um, and also, on behalf of the collaborators, I should say that there's not as much agreement among these three as they are apparently displaying right now. And also that th that there is a the receiving feedback was one also of of having your styles sort of pushed and pulled. So, um, Reinhold has a question. Well, first of all, congratulations to all. It's a fantastic book, and I haven't yet read it, opened it to see. But uh, in the spirit of Sherlock Holmes, so. <laughs> Has there been a crime? I mean, that, that question actually, I, I was glad that Matt mentioned that in his opening talk, because it did come up for me in, in opening the book, at least. I haven't had a chance to read everything, except for even an introduction. Like, evidence of what? Like, what, what has happened here? Maybe there's a way, I was trying to re, like reconfigure the, the, anticipating some of the essays, you know, the themes in, in, in a way that would, you know, present and synthesize that evidence in, in the form of the answer to the question, what has happened? There, there is one essay, uh, Eigen's, in which there's a criminal. Sure. <laughs> and, but what, yeah, I think it turns out somebody stole something from the archive or something, right? <laughs> yeah, but which I, is to say, but I don't mean, you say I mean <laughs> historically. Historically, historically, historically. Uh, well, perhaps, perhaps you could also say historically. You know, something, some crime has been committed against the the, the, the sort of um, structures of knowledge that that are that are worth reproducing or, 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 or building. But but evidence, you know, in the sense that something has happened historically in the world, like out out there, uh, in a way that then can be empirically or otherwise. Tabulated, map narrated, etc. Yeah, I feel like I stole something. <laughs> 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 so, uh, first of all, I was going to say uh, thank you. That's a very, uh, you know, uh, amazing and, uh, nugget, you know, to, to mull over. Uh, my answer, I, I was going to thank the editors. Uh, I don't know which angle I should keep it. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So, first of all, you're being very humble, I think, all of you. Uh, you know, what was encouraged was precisely the kind of quote that you pointed out to uh, Anu's, uh, Anu Sadiqi's, right? The vulnerability, right? In, in the in, with the researchers' vulnerability, giving them the space to be vulnerable, that the evidence they're looking at might not amount to something and to sort of contemplate what happens if this evidence disappears, right? how the narrative will fall apart, how what rests on precisely this thing being sort of holding together, you know, precariously as it is. And I think that for me was, the crime was that we have already only held up as you know, evidence which is solid and it's stable and can be peer reviewed and all that, right? So what, in the, in the past, right? So what, what about histories in which the evidence is multiple uh, iterations of a story, right? Or, or letters which are disappeared and only one person can look at it, right? So can those be histories, right? It's, uh, I don't know if it's, it's a, one crime. Is, yeah. <laughs> so that would be a vertical of it. No, I don't know if it's, if it's, it's, I don't know if it's crime. crime. I don't know if it's crime, but it, it would be a story for which uh, uh, testimony would be hard to, uh, you know, assemble. Right, the test for which the testimonies have disappeared or are disappearing. So, how how to tell that story? Right. Um, Reynold, I don't know if I understood your question or if this is an answer, but to me, the crime is the loss of grand narratives in architectural history. Um, I like stories. I think they're memorable in terms of teaching. But I think more important politically, they're important because as artificial and authoritarian as a grand narrative might be, I think they're also inspirational for change going forward. And I certainly understand and respect people in architectural history who don't want to compose a grand moralizing narrative, but I think something's lost when um, we don't at least understand 
those forms of narrativity. So I guess I'd say for myself, and I don't know that Michael and Zainab share my sentiments about it, that's the crime um, or the loss or the absence that impelled me to want to work with Michael and Zainab and all the collaborators on thinking about different forms of narrative. I'm not the one who made that narrative, <laughs> I'm perfectly honest, but um, I mean, there's probably a crime for each essay, it's true. I don't think there's one crime for, in our case, when we wrote that, the crime was quite frankly, or the anxiety, let's say, I'm not talking about this, the anxiety was that all the all the changes we seem to be making in our cultural history and changing the um, geographical focal parts of history, I think there's an anxiety that they're not um, real changes. That's so much that we should, you know, the banister glitters key of um, the non-historical style. We think we are, um, you know, getting rid of it, but we're not. It's a haunt. It's not a crime. It's yes, a ghost. it's not a crime. It's like the ghost. And our, our deep anxiety is that we do not want to change. Uh, so it's contra almost contra Danny. No matter how hard you try, the crime you can't the you can't pr prove like proof of a crime, as it were, doesn't make it go away. Like j j justice or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can actually, Timothy is not here. I thought he was coming. Um, I think Timothy would have a different answer. Oh, his, his, yeah. for him, disciplinary shock is not a crime. It's, yeah. It's and then also having had contact with a legal, <clears throat> let's say, uh, you know, apparatus, and the fact that we are meant to think that evidence means that there is a crime, you know, et cetera. So he would take that apart, maybe. Um, not to put words in his mouth, but. Um, so we have time for maybe one more question or comment, or if the authors, if any of the authors, many of whom are here, wanted to respond to something that um, Matt said. <laughs> now is your moment, he's on stage. Um, any more comments or questions? Uh, Ivan Nikolaev. Uh, no, I was just gonna say that on the question of Sherlock Holmes, so he also, there's a section that I just pulled up right now where he says, um, you cannot theorize without sufficient data, and then draws a material parallel saying, you need sufficient clay to make bricks. So my question here is like, um, how do we know, or I guess, is there a way to discriminate from having sufficient data to create these theoretical observations versus not having enough and trying to mask that insufficiency as enough? This is a good question. How do you know when you, I mean, you, um, in fact, Matt alluded to it in reading the text that there are some archives are too wide, some are too small, and said, but you were describing a kind of diversity. But how, are there techniques, are there ways that we know when you have enough to make something, or not quite, or too much, and, you know. I, I will uh, borrow from Francis Bacon and say, you take a leap of faith. Leap of faith, exactly. Yeah. I was going to say, I, you, you were earlier uh, articulating a concern of being seen as empirical. And so as if there's, you know, it's an easy dichotomy between that is the accumulation of fact and then theorizing. And um, to be, you know, when Carlo Ginsburg talks about Sherlock Holmes, it's in the context of connoisseurship which is the constitution of a self that embodies kinds of techniques, whether it's the Pascalian hab habitus or Borgia's habitus, which is stolen from Pas I mean, um, but there's a, there's a sense that, that there's that middle term of technical virtue in a kind of way that is in between the accumulation of fact and interpretation. The danger is assuming that it's totally probative. Um, and one of the things I really liked in your volume is that you both enact that as historians, but you're also often telling stories where there's contesting evidentiary practices, whether it's the valuation of buildings, um, this really beautiful moment in Eric Carver's where there's two really art different views of IP, right? One of which it lines with older narratives in architectural history, and the other which doesn't. Um, so I think, it, it, you know, that 
The answer is not, are we empiricist or not? It's what kind of post-empiricism are we interested in in instantiating? Um, and recognizing that there's not going to be a nice cover narrative. Closure is not coming through a philosophy of the history of architecture in any sort of way. Closure is going to come through attempts to, it's not going to be closure, but there's going to be a lot of attempts to practice that are according with kinds of archives that actually map those conflicts as part of their story. And I think that's what I find bracing, one of the things I find bracing about this book. So mapping conflict rather than finding the crime, that sounds like a great place to end. I really want to thank, uh, first of all, you guys for pushing through with the book. Thank you for making us do it. And thank you, Matt, for uh, your response. And thank you to all for coming and to all on Zoom. And uh, for the doctoral students who are registered for the next event, you can stay here to participate in it at 3. And um, everybody else, you can stay and linger. Thank you so much. <laughs>